The following program is a special presentation of the Big Ten Network, produced in association with the University of Wisconsin. The infant brain is complex and malleable, shaped by every new encounter. What are the emotional effects of a nurturing childhood environment versus one dominated by abuse and neglect? We'll take a look at the crucial role of caregivers during the formative years and what can be done to help at-risk children. Next, during Office Hours. Hi, I'm Ken Goldstein, Professor of Political Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Today we are tackling the age-old question of nature versus nurture as it relates to children's emotional and behavioral development. Joining us is Dr. Seth Pollack, a College of Letters and Sciences Distinguished Professor of Psychology. He's also an investigator at the Wiseman Center for Human Development. Professor, Politics is, Professor Pollack is an expert in the fields of developmental, emotion, and psychopathology, and was recently featured on the PBS series, This Emotional Life. Seth, welcome to Office Hours. Thank you. I must have had some sort of Freudian thing when I said politics instead well, of- Well, it's hard uh, to move from politics to psychology, politics to, isn't it? Politics to Pollack. Um, let me start out by asking you, why is that time period from six months to three years so crucial? The focus on early child development is actually fairly recent. If you think back to uh, times when we were young and even our parents were young, there was very little attention given to children. Um, you might recall hearing things like children are supposed to be seen and not heard. Uh, but think about it today. We've had a full pendulum swing to the point where parenting has become a competitive sport. Uh, adults feel very invested um, in their children's development and engage in a lot of activities to try and foster that. And so this focus on the role of experience and the effects of parenting um, on children's development uh, has really started to focus a lot on early infancy. Now, uh, one thing that's not clear is whether infancy is really those first three to six months, whether that's really the critical time period or whether that's just a period where we can actually observe a lot of the changes that infants are undergoing. So there's, there's, there's a bunch of things you said that I want to get into. So obviously it's to the good that we're paying attention more to kids, but I do want to get into this discussion of, you know, we're, we're, we're both parents of kids of similar ages, under 12 and between 6 and 12, and there is this intense, almost crazy focus by parents on, you know, making sure your two-year-old can do Rosetta Stone Mandarin. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> But what you're studying, though, is students who are not coming from maybe overly obsessive helicopter parents, but, 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 but children who are coming from very tough, neglected, abusive environments during those key years. Tell me about that. That's right. The, um, the age-old question is nature and nurture. Uh, to what extent are humans born with certain aspects of our personality and behavior and skills hardwired into our brains at birth? And to what extent are these processes the result of what we're learning and social experiences? That's a very difficult question to get at. Um, why is it difficult? Because how do you ever measure a human that hasn't had any experience? Let me interrupt you for one second. You used the word learning, mm -hmm. and I was, I was reading some, some, some things you wrote. You said, you know, learning's not just the ABCs and math. That's not what you mean by learning, right? You mean That's something right. different. So look, tell us by about learning, that. By learning, what I mean is the flexibility or plasticity of the human brain. How do we extract, take information out of the environment, pick up on cues like what a smile means, um, what a furrowed brow uh, means, um, how do we break into the kind of languages that we're hearing? Um, all of these things require the developing infant to pick up on things in the environment, figure out what they mean and how to use them. And that learning uh, reflects biological processes in the human brain. So it's emotional learning, and then when you say biological processes, it's not just that it's influencing my personality, but you're actually saying that those early learning experiences are influencing the hardwiring in the brain. That's right. Um, instead of just thinking of something as being in the brain, some skill being in the brain, and then the brain getting big enough for us to be able to use it, there's now a lot of evidence that the kinds of things that we're being exposed to are actually shaping the way, is, the, way the brain is beginning to develop. So it's really a two-way street. Um, the aspects of the brain that we're born with are helping us to acquire 
information, learn information from the environment, but as those experiences are happening to us, that very well may be shaping and directing the way our brains are growing. So it's almost akin to exercise. So would the model have been 20, 30, 40 years ago that a brain's a brain's a brain and it, you get one <laughs> when you're born and it develops no matter what happens to you in life. You're saying that it actually changes depending on what you do in life. That's right. I mean, a, a very long time ago, we had a much more social view that, that things were really learned. We didn't know much about neuroscience in the brain. Then we sort of went the other way and we became very focused on biology. Uh, for example, looking for uh, gene, particular genes that cause mental illness or a part of the brain that didn't work that caused behavioral problems. That was a bit of a one-way street, the idea being that something wrong with the brain resulted in some unusual kind of behavior. Now we're in a much more uh, dynamic or interactive mode of thinking about human development, where we're looking at what the human brain is bringing to a situation, what that brain is actually receiving, and how that interplay between the developing brain and the social experience are changing both the kinds of experiences we're having and the way those experiences are changing the growth of the brain. So let's take a short break now, and when we come back, I want to talk about what a brain that's giving and receiving in an environment that's pretty bad, what happens there. So please stay with us on Office Hours. We're talking with Professor Seth Pollack from the Department of Psychology at University of Wisconsin-Madison. This program is a production of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. If you have comments about this broadcast, please email them to programming at uc.wisc.edu. Where others saw lumber, we recognized a treasure. Where others saw the night, we chose the stars. Where others saw pieces, we unlocked the puzzle that could mean the end of paralysis and cancer. Since 1848, thinkers and achievers at Wisconsin have fearlessly sought ideas that transform the world. Keep on, Wisconsin. Keep on. Welcome back to Office Hours. I'm here with Professor Seth Pollack from the Department of Psychology at University of Wisconsin-Madison. So Seth, your, 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 your graduate school work, your early work, did focus on abuse, but then you got into studying a very particular sort of situation. Kids, children who had been in very awful, abusive situations in foreign orphanages. I want to ask you what you found, but how, how did you end up doing that? How did you get to that particular area? They're both are very different kinds of stories. Our original work uh, with, child, with children who had been abused arose because of wanting to find a way to examine how emotions are actually learned. Um, the problem there is that how would we ever find an individual that had never been exposed to emotions? Um, we're inundated with emotional experience from the moment we're born. And you probably remember when your kids were born, there's hardly a moment when there's not uh, cuddling and laughing and crying and faces and voices and touch. Um, so really, from moments after birth, we're already learning. One way to get at that is to look at individuals across cultures where maybe there are different social rules about emotion. And another way to do that, we thought, was to study children who had been abused. Uh, these are children who are growing up within environments that are really not typical for humans, where the individuals that are supposed to be protecting and caring for children are actually harming and threatening them. And our reasoning was that if we start to look at the kinds of problems that these children have, we might be able to learn something about the effects of social experience on these emotions. I was doing this research, and uh, there was a newspaper story about one of our research findings, and parents called me. Um, there was a group of parents in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, and they actually just called my office one day and asked me if my laboratory would be willing to devote some attention uh, to the study of their children. It turned out that this group of children had been adopted from orphanages in Romania. Now tell me about these Romanian orphanages. That is a particular 
style is the right world, but that was a particularly unique experience that a large number of kids had in Romanian orphanages at a certain time period. That's right. It was very interesting. Um, during the collapse of many Eastern European economies uh, in the early 1990s, there were just many, many children. There were families. They're called orphans, but these children aren't technically orphans. Their parents were alive, but they were unable to care for them. Governments in many of these countries, Russia, uh, Romania, um, these orphanages have been set up all over the world, uh, predominantly not in the United States, though. Um, governments set up these orphanages, which they call hospitals, and they were intended to help care for these children uh, and provide food, rudimentary, basic medical care, um, and shelter for children. But it turns out that mass caregiving is really not the way humans are wired to be raised. And for many children, this created a lot of problems for them. Tell us even more about that. I mean, in one of your articles, you quote a, I think it was a United Nations study that went and inspected some of these orphanages. And right. what the words were appalling. And you know, tell me about that. Well, uh, in some of these orphanages, there were uh, maybe one or two adults trying to care for 30 or 40 babies. Um, that's, it, by, by standard, by, to, by comparison, um, in Dane County, Wisconsin, one adult can care for no more than three babies in a child care setting. So that ratio of one to 40 really uh, means that a child's getting very little attention. Um, they're not, not being held, not being touched, not, not getting spoken to, not getting e read to. Exactly. And, and in, in addition to that, think about um, something even more personal, an adult that really becomes, becomes familiar enough with you to know that there are foods you like or don't like, that there's a way you like to be held, that there's certain things that comfort you or that you're scared of. These, these are the kinds of things that happen um, in a more normative caregiving environment for children, but that ca just can't happen uh, in a condition of mass caregiving. And then you found that these kids differ in some pretty significant ways. So they're adopted, they come to the United States, they come to the state of Wisconsin. Their situation here is pretty good, yet there's these long-term effects. For, for some, not all. I mean, one of the interesting things about the research is that some of these children seem to weather this experience and, and seem okay. It's not the majority, it's the minority. Um, and one of the things that we don't know is, does that have to do with how long the child was in the orphanage or the age at which they were adopted? Uh, does it have to do with the fact that some children maybe ended up being taken under the wing of an adult caregiver uh, in the orphanage setting and actually got more attention? Um, that's, that's information that we don't have. So I want, I want to hear a little bit more specifically about that and then hear what the lessons of that are, is for other sorts of learning and attachment and what happens with abused kids. So please stay with us on Office Hours here with Dr. Seth Pollack from the Department of Psychology. Great People is our campaign for need-based scholarship aid. It's the key to the long-term well-being of the university as a whole. In 1970, tuition cost about $500. Today, it's about $9,000. We don't want UW-Madison to be a university that is deemed to be out of reach. The Great People Scholarship gives students a chance to succeed in life. Support the Great People Scholarship. Visit uwgreatpeople.org. Welcome back to Office Hours. I'm here with Dr. Seth Pollack from the Department of Psychology, University of Wisconsin-Madison. So Seth, we were talking about the research you've done with adopted children from overseas. Tell me what the exact findings were. Well, at this point, we've looked at over 1,000 children from about 40 different countries. And the findings are really interesting. One of the things that we found is that these children's language development looks pretty good. That's interesting because for many of these children, English is their second language, um, and they seem to pick up on things like grammar just fine, but they sometimes have trouble organizing it um, into coherent narratives or stories, and that's an interesting area to explore. We also found that a lot of these children have motor problems. In these orphanage settings, children are often kept confined to cribs, 
um, and not given opportunities to crawl and play uh, and interact uh, with the physical world. And so when we study these children as early adolescents, they have trouble with balance and movement and, and some aspects of motor development. And so that's an interesting clue that early experiences of movement and ex physical exploration are actually very important. That's very interesting. So you could say the language might be some sort of a function of you know, they learned it differently, and so we may want to compare them with other people in other countries learning language. But the motor skills is really significant. It is, and uh, there's some suggestion that the parts of the brain that we think of as being responsible for balance and movement are also important for thinking, for organizing information, and many of these children are also having difficulty in classroom settings and school. And it could be that there are some brain circuits that really require that kind of movement and exploration to develop properly, and this could explain why these children are both having balance and motor problems as well as some of the attentional problems that they encounter in classroom settings. So in some ways, if you're a poker player, those motor problems are a tell or the canary in the coal mine that are suggesting there's other issues going Very on. Very much so, yes. Now, this is not just significant for the over 1,000 adopted children that you've studied here. This has other pretty serious implications for how we think about learning, how we think about the development of the brain, correct? Well, it is true. It, um, it raises tremendous questions, especially for people that like to argue that everything's sort of built into the brain at birth. This is suggesting that the kinds of experiences that we have really matter in terms of the organization of the brain. And these, these early experiences may have lasting impact. Uh, they might not look the same in infancy, but when we look at these children in elementary school, in early adolescence, and later adolescence, we see the imprint of these early experiences in very complex forms of social behavior as well. You know, you know like I say, as I'm sitting here as, you know, as parents and hanging out with other parents who worry about every single little thing our kid has done since day one, is that just a straw man you're talking about, about people who say that everything's hardwired. I can't yes. tell you how, <laughs> how foreign that seems to me at this it, point. It is an extreme straw man for an argument. Um, on the other hand, there's another, there's a straw man at the other end too, which is uh, more affluent parents that, that worry about every experience their child has. And uh, it's very clear, for example, that early experiences do matter. But it's also very clear that children don't need DVDs and flashcards. And, and a lot of the superfluous things that parents uh, often feel nervous about not getting for their children. Sometimes we send a message, well, we're trying to send a message that early experience matters. Sometimes we send a message to new parents that if they're not doing a lot of fairly artificial things with their children, they're somehow damaging or hurting their children. And, and that's certainly not true. Okay. We're going to continue our conversation with Dr. Seth Pollack, Dr. Seth Pollack from the Department of Psychology, University of Wisconsin Madison. Please stay with us on Office Hours. This program is a production of the University of Wisconsin Madison. If you have comments about this broadcast, please email them to programming at uc.wisc.edu. Welcome back to Office Hours. I'm Ken Goldstein with Seth Pollack from the Department of Psychology, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Seth, you did a couple other experiments with children who had been, who'd been abused and compared them to children from more standard upbringing. And, and one of them I thought was, was pretty interesting and I would have wanted to be one of the actors where you had some graduate students in a room next door get into a very loud fake fight and you saw how the kids reacted differently and how those reactions endured or didn't. Tell me about that. That actually happened because one of my undergraduate students uh, felt that the studies we were doing were too far removed from children's actual experiences. He questioned me about what the playground significance of our research was. And so this study was actually designed to get at the kind of experience that a child living in a stressful household really might have. As you said, the child came into the room and was asked to play the world's most boring game. The child <laughs> sat in front of a computer screen and was asked to press a button every time a picture of a different toy showed up on the screen. And they were supposed to press the button for every new toy except a basketball. 
And they did this 899 times. Oh. Now, the point of this is that it's not boring. No, that's not abuse. That, that, well, maybe a little bit. Okay. Um, it's a task that I can't sit through myself. But the, the important thing that this makes a child do is to keep at something that's not really interesting. And this is a good measure of a child's ability to focus their attention and keep going when something's not rewarding or fun. Now, while the child was doing that, they began to overhear two adults in the next room begin to have an argument. We would say to the child, this isn't about you, sorry about the cheap walls, you just keep going, you're doing fine. Um, but we really were measuring a number of different things that were going on. We were measuring aspects of the child's physiology. We were measuring their heart rate, their autonomic nervous system, their brain activity. There were a lot of things that, that were going on while this was all happening. And the child, of course, was just sitting there doing the task. The people in the next room began to argue, and what we found was that all children, these were four-year-old children, all children began to direct their attention to what was going on in the next room, as we all would. That was very strange to hear people starting to argue. But for most children, when the adult in the room with them said, doesn't concern us, don't worry about it, you're doing a good job, go back to the task, most four-year-olds then shifted their attention back and went back to the boring task. They showed a little bit of arousal when they first started to hear an argument. It's novel, it's new, we don't often hear adults fighting, um, especially in a laboratory situation. And so they responded to it, turned it off, and went back. They showed good control. What happened to children that were growing up in physically abusive homes is their attention went to the argument next door. They became very aroused by it, by it and they didn't bring themselves back down. As you can imagine, their performance on the task went down as well because that's where their brains were. Their brains were following the fight in the next room. Now, what we ended up thinking about this study was gee, what happens to a kid growing up in a household where there's a lot of violence and fighting? The kid's upstairs in the room trying to do their homework, their adults fighting in the next room. Where do you think the kid's attention is going to be? Down there. We have only a couple seconds left, but it's a defense mechanism that these kids learned that's going to have a negative impact the rest of their life. Is that correct? A defense mechanism or a good coping mechanism. Coping mechanism. It might be that if you're an individual growing up in an environment where people that are supposed to be protecting you could hurt you, by attending to adults being angry or threatening, your brain's probably doing exactly what you'd want your brain to do, learning a signal in the environment, picking up on it, and teaching yourself to respond to that very quickly. Seth, thanks so much for joining us on Thank Office you. Hours, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Don't forget, Office Hours is on the web via our university website, Facebook, or Twitter. Take a look and let us know your thoughts. From the University of Wisconsin-Madison, this has been Office Hours. Thanks for stopping by. The preceding program was produced by the University of Wisconsin in association with the Big Ten Network.